الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم وقالوا لولا انزل علیہ آیات من ربه قل انما الآیات عند اللہ وانما انا نظیر مبین اولم یکفهم انا انزلنا علیک الكتاب یتلا علیہم ان فی ذالک لرحمت و ذکر لقوم یؤمنون صدق اللہ صدق اللہ من الرزیم Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters, the subject is Al-Quran, a miracle of miracles. I have read to you a verse from the Holy Quran. As we proceed, I will explain the verse and what Allah Baridala says about this subject of miracles. But let me explain to you what a miracle is. What is a miracle? A mojiza. A miracle is an impossibility. Something beyond human endeavor, human effort. For example, one of us, while this meeting is carrying on, he falls unconscious and he expires. A doctor is called up and the doctor certifies that the person is dead. Another doctor is brought forward to give his opinion and he also certifies that the man is dead. Take the body away, prepare for burial. But there comes along a man of God, sees this dead person, dead body, and he says, he commands, Kum bi iznillah, wake up, get up in the name of Allah, and the person gets up, alive and well. We say it's a miracle, because it was an impossibility, certified by two doctors, and yet the person has come back to life. Miracle. But suppose the man was dead for three days, put in a mortuary, in a morgue, and after three days somebody comes along, the man is gone as hard as rock, and he shouts at the cops, Kum biiznillah, Arise in the name of Allah, and the man comes back from the dead, from the mortuary, from the morgue. We say that is a greater miracle, because it's a greater impossibility. But after the person is dead and buried, his bones have rotted in the grave, and somebody cries, Kum bi iznillah, and the person gets out of the grave, alive, breathing well, we say that is still a greater miracle. So greater the impossibility, the greater the miracle. I hope this definition, you know, is simple enough for everybody to grasp. Now in that sense, the Quran is a miracle of eloquence. In the first instance, you see, nations before Islam were sent prophets. And mankind had a tendency to demand proof by some supernatural acts. Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, the holy prophet Moses, he was given a type of miracle which was akin to magic. He was among the magicians in, in Egypt. So he had to contend with these magicians and Allah gave him a miracle to confound these magicians. Firaun, thinking that Musa -Islam was another magician, he brought forth his own magicians to play the part. And the magicians, the Egyptian magicians, they had little, little magic sticks, or magic wands, and they threw them on the ground. And all these little sticks became little, little snakes, serpents. Allah Bari Ta'ala had already given Hazrat Musa -Islam an experience with his rod on the mount. Now he knew what he was to do, so he threw his rod, and the rod turned into a serpent. And this serpent swallowed up all the little snakes of the Egyptians. And Hazrat Musa salam picked up the serpent, and it turned back once more into a rod. And the Egyptian magicians, they realized that this is no magic. This is not hypnotism, this is not mesmerism. Because to hypnotize a person, you cast a spell, you make the person to see what is really not there, it's an illusion is created. 
the sticks, you can make it appear like snakes by casting a spell. But here, all the little sticks had vanished. To demesmerize, it would have been to make the snakes to appear as sticks. No, no, no. But these sticks had vanished into the serpent, and the serpent was a rod, and the rod was no thicker than what it was before. A greater miracle. And the Egyptian magicians, they confessed that this is no magic. This is something beyond. It was a miracle, a real miracle, not magic. So Allah gives miracles according to the mentality, the needs of the people. People with magical minds, they were confounded with magic, superior magic, real magic. Hazrat Isa salam, Jesus Christ, when he appears on the scene, he comes among a people who were steeped in Greek medicine. They were performing wonders with, with medicine. So Allah gives him healing powers, healing those born blind. A person who goes blind by shock or by some damage, infection, is quite a different thing from one who is born blind. And Allah Baritala gave him those powers of healing those who are born blind and the lepers, and he gave life back to the dead, revive the dead, be iznillah. Type of miracle to convince the people. Our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he comes among a people who were boasting about their language. The language was the boast. Their eloquence, their poetry. They said, we are an eloquent people, we are the Arabs. And the rest of the world is ajam, dumb, compared to us. They boasted. They would ask, this is you, in your language, you ajami. How many words have you got for a horse in your language? Synonyms for a horse. Oh man, said, maybe half a dozen. He said, you see, we can give you a hundred. In our language. He says, how many words, synonyms you have for a sword? Oh, anybody would say half a dozen. He said, you see, in my language I can give you a hundred. So you see, we are the eloquent people and you people are all dumb, ajam. So among such a people when he comes along, the greatest miracle that he gave was the Qur'an. That the language of the Qur'an in the first instance was beating the people. And they realized, people with sense, that this is not poetry, this is not uh, prose, this is something beyond our understanding, and people accepted the faith. But let me tell you what a non-Muslim, non-Muslims, they have to say about the Quran and its eloquence. A. J. Arbery, an Englishman, who translated the Holy Quran into English. In his preface he says, Whenever I hear the Quran chanted, is a foreigner. He had just learned Arabic. Arabic is not his mother tongue. And he says, Whenever I hear the Quran chanted, meaning beautifully recited, it is as though I am listening to music. Underneath the flowing melody, there is sounding all the time the insistent beat of a drum. It is like the beating of my heart. You can't help vibrating on the wavelength of the Qur'an. Then Reverend Bosworth Smith, a Christian missionary, he wrote a book on Muhammad and Muhammadanism. In his book he says about our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Holy Qur'an, he says, illiterate himself, an ummi, scarcely able to read or write, he was yet the author of a book, which we do not agree, that Muhammad wasallam was not the author of the book. He says, according to his belief, understanding that Muhammad wasallam is the author of this book. So he is yet the author of a book, which is a poem, a code of laws, a book of common prayers, and a Bible all in one. And is reverenced to this day by a sixth of the whole human race as a miracle. As a miracle of purity, of style, of wisdom and of truth. It is the one miracle claimed by Muhammad. His standing miracle, he called it. And a miracle indeed it is. Without doubt, it is a mochiza. An enemy testifies that this is a miracle indeed. And Allah draws our attention to this. 
in the verse I read to you from the Holy Quran, from Surah An-Kabut, chapter 29. I'm coming to it. Allah says, وَقَالُوا And they say, who the Muslims, they say, لَوْ لَا أُنزِلَ لَيْهِ آيَاتٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِ so why is not a sign, a miracle, a mu'jiza given to him by his Lord? This is a demand. They had heard about the miracles of Moses. They had heard about the miracles of Jesus. Now they want some similar performance from the Prophet of Islam. Like, for example, they were asking, he says, look, O Muhammad, they were trying to humor him. They were trying to make a mockery of him. So he said, look, O Muhammad, you say you are a prophet of God. Why don't you perform some miracles? Like the prophets of old. Like this Ohad, Mount Ohad, outside Mecca. Why don't you turn it into gold? Then we will know that you are a true man of God. Or put up a ladder up into heaven. Go up that ladder and bring a book down. Then we will believe that you are a true messenger of God or make rivers to gush out in the desert then we will know that you are somebody that we can hearken to وَقَالُوا and they say لَوْ لَا أُنْذِلَ لَيْهِ آيَاتٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِ in answer to that Allah makes him to say قُلْ tell them إِنَّمَا الْآيَاتُ إِنْدَ اللَّهِ so most certainly signs, miracles are in the hands of my Lord in the hands of Allah I am only a warner, clear cut, straightforward, plain, simple, warner. Is this not enough for you? Awalam yakfihim. Anna anzalla alaykal kitaba. Yutla alayhim. Say, is this not enough for them that you rehearse to them, that you read to them a book which we have revealed to you, O Muhammad? This book we have revealed to you. O Muhammad, is that not enough for them? To you, an ummi, a person who doesn't know how to read or write, you are rehearsing this book to them, is that not enough in itself that it should be a miracle? You know this human child, this little child Muhammad, he grew, grew up in front of your eyes, and up to the age of 40 he was like your own child. You know every move he made, every things that he did, you know everything about him. And this man who had had no schooling, now he's coming along and rehearsing the book to them. Is that not enough as a miracle? The book itself, Allah says, is a miracle. And a miracle indeed it is. A miracle, in the first instance, we Muslims, we believe. That this book is Allah's kalam. Allah bari ta'ala revealed it to the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The enemies of Islam, they agree that this is the book that Muhammad left. Friends and foe alike, they say this is the book that Muhammad left. But they say that this is not Allah's kalam. This is Muhammad's cleverness. Very clever man. So we say, look he was an ummi. An unlearned person he said, yes, but wasn't he a very clever man? Wasn't he a great speaker? Wasn't he a great thinker? Ah, we would have to agree that he was. He was exceptionally good in all these qualities. Then he said, look, why could he not have rehashed into a beautiful language what he heard from his environment and dished it off as revelation? It's his handiwork. Allah testifies against that. He says, وَمَا يَنْتِكُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ He says, He does not speak from His own desire. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْنُ يُوحَىٰ It is no less than an inspiration sent down to Him. أَلَّمَهُ شَدِيدُ الْكُوَىٰ He is taught by one mighty in power. We believe that this is Allah's kalah. Allah testifies and we testify. But the outsider, he says, No, this is Muhammad's handiwork. So I I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, let us for a moment agree with the skeptic, with the cynic, with the critic. Let's agree with him and admit that this is Muhammad's book, that he is the author, though we know he is not. So he said, all right, so you say this is Muhammad's production. He says, yes. 
So now I want you to agree with me that this is a one-man job, one-man effort. If he did it, this is Muhammad's own handiwork. So well, there's no hesitation in accepting that, that this is his handiwork. I said, right. In that case, I said, now I present to you this book in its material magnitude, in its size. This is one man job. You have here another job which you claim to be Allah's Kalam, the Bible. This Bible consists of the Old Testament, which is actually the book of the Jews, and the New Testament, old and new put together, the Christians have inherited it. Old and new put together. In this encyclopedia called the Bible, there are 66 books inside. What we might call surahs, in the Quran we have 114 surahs, they have 66 books, big and small. But these 66 books are authored by 40 different persons. This is what they tell us. 40 different people, their writings lying around, manuscript form, whatever form, that they got them together into one book. 40 different people wrote, went together to produce this one book. This is a one-man production, if at all. <laughs> Out of those 40 different authors of the Bible, the greatest writer, the most voluminous writer of all is a person called Saint Paul, the real founder of Christianity, Saint Paul. This Saint Paul wrote more than 50% of the books of the New Testament. There are 27 books in the New Testament. Out of the 27, Paul wrote 14, more than 50%. But those 14 books put together, they don't consist more than this, what I'm showing you now, not more than this. 14 put together. The greatest writer, the most learned writer, that's 14 books. This is one man job. On the physical magnitude of it, we say it's a miracle. And this book, the Quran, is not talking anything, everything, filling up, is a filler. No, no, no. It's a very, very concentrated stuff, guiding mankind into all aspects of life, solving all his problems for eternity till Yawm al Qiyamah. So, Allah says, is this not enough for you? That this book we have given to this man and ummi. Then the contents of the book. You see, in this book, the Quran, some of these things I'm demonstrating to you, the subject is so vast, wallah, it, take, it will take a number of talks to deal with the whole subject. And I do not want to hold you people up here till midnight or till early morning, I can. Just on this subject alone, I can keep you all here till one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. But I do not think it's fair or just to you or to me to do such a thing. So I will have to curtail a lot of things because I, as a layman, I can give you a dozen different miracles in the Quran. The learned man, perhaps he can give you a hundred miraculous nature of the Quran. I myself, as a layman, I can give you a dozen, which we will not be able to touch tonight, but I give you a few. Number one, the concept of Allah bari ta'ala. You see, we know Allah by His attributes. And Allah gives us His attributes in His book. We do not have to create these attributes. We have not to concoct them as to what Allah is. So He tells us what He is. He is Ar-Rahman, He is Ar-Rahim, He is Al-Malik, He is Al-Quddus, He is Al-Salam, He is Al-Mu'min, He is Al-Muhaymin, He is Al-Aziz, He is Al-Jabbar, He is Al-Mutakabbir, and on and on and on. He gives us, Allah gives us in His book, 99 beautiful attributes. Like a necklace of pearls, 99 attributes with a crowning glory, Allah, a big pendant, Allah, proper noun, Allah, 99 attributes and one proper name, Allah, makes it a hundred. And I'm asking learned people, doctors, 
lawyers, philosophers, when I meet them, I say, look, tell me now. I would like to know from you, how many attributes can you imagine that you can attribute to God? How many? Come, try, try. So he says, well, he is the Father in heaven. I say, yes. He is, God is love. I say, yes. No, no, tell us, whatever. Come on. He is just. I say, yes. He is holy. I say, yes. He is merciful. I say, yes. Come on, come on, come on. You know the cleverest of us, the cleverest of mankind, the most learned of us, he can't go beyond a dozen. He can't imagine with all his learning more than a dozen attributes from his knowledge. He can't. I said, you see, this Ummi, if he did this work, he gives you 99. He said, well, you see, Muhammad was a genius. And a genius can do ten times better than us. He admits. He's a genius. Still, it is not Allah's kalam. A genius can do ten times better than what I can. I concede that. I take off my hat to Muhammad. He is great. But he is no prophet. He is not a man sent by God. I said, all right, all right. But now look. In the names that you mentioned... In the first six, the first one was the Father in Heaven. But let's say, in a number of tries, in the first half a dozen, you can't help using the word Father. They say, Abbana, O oh, our Father which art in Heaven, hallowed be Thy name, Thy kingdom, O oh, our Father, the loving Father in Heaven. The first half a dozen, you must come out with the word Father. He said, yes, anybody. If you try, the father is there, is dangling before everybody. Because the Christians have made it famous. The Jews were calling him the father in heaven. And the Christians call him the father in heaven. The commonest, this word, father. I said, you know what? In the list of 99, this word father is not there. That is a miracle. See, the miracle is that the thing that is being dangled before him for 23 years, people are talking about the Father in heaven, the Father in heaven, easiest to take. He doesn't take it, he doesn't catch it. Either consciously or unconsciously. We know it's not his word. It's Allah bari ta'ala. He's making him not to use the word Abb. In Arabic, it's easier than Rabb. He's Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. He's the Lord, cherisher, sustainer of the worlds. He's Rabb, Rabb, Rabb. And Rabb is harder than Abb in Hebrew as well as in Arabic. <laughs> it's a beautiful expression. The Father in heaven is a beautiful expression. Why wouldn't Muhammad have it? Or why wouldn't Allah allow it? You know why? Because this word, this name, this attribute, beautiful attribute, has been abused. It's a beautiful attribute. Words have a tendency to change the meanings. Good words, beautiful words, innocent words. Like the word comrade. You see, this word comrade is like sahab, my friend, my companion. Companion means, in French, person who break bread together, that we eat together, he is my companion. Companies, panis means bread. When we break bread together, we are like one brotherhood. Beautiful word. Companion. Comrade. Beautiful. But you know in the United States, if you address me as Comrade Didat, you know the, the, the CIA or the FBI will have me checked up. Straight away they'll take me away, you know, to find out what are my philosophies, what am I preaching about. Do you know that? I hope. You don't use such a word on me. Look, the word is beautiful. Look at the dictionary. Dictionary meaning is innocent. Good. But it has other associations in people's mind. Comrade associates you with communism. So we eschew it. We won't use it. There are other words. Like gay. G-A-Y. Gay. Beautiful word. See, when I was going to school, when I was a young boy, I was teaching us poetry, poetry, English poetry. I still remember, 
I am 70 years and 4 days old now. I still remember. It says, Gentle lords and ladies gay, On the mountain dawns the day. Gentle lords and ladies gay, On the mountain dawns the day. Beautiful word. You know, happy and gay. It says happy and gay. He's a jovial person. Ladies, gentlemen, and men, men and women, all. We say, oh, they are very, very happy people. Happy and gay. Jolly people. Jovial people. Beautiful word. But it has acquired other connotations now. As I was growing up, I'm reading the newspapers, and I read this word gay in there, and it creates some fishy smell. And I don't know what they're talking about. Gay. Gay. Is not the gay that I learned at school. You know, something fishy about it. I didn't catch it for a long time. I couldn't catch it. You know, whenever the word gay occurred in the newspapers, I couldn't catch such a beautiful word. What is this? What they're talking about? It smells. But what the smell is about? Because I was using it. Gay. I would say I'm happy and gay. Today, if you say that our chairman is happy and gay, you know, you'll only shoot me. You see, innocent word, beautiful word, but it has acquired other connotations. Allah tells us in the Quran, وَلَا تَقُولُوا رَعِنَا وَقُولُمْ زُرْنَا The verse, the Jews were using this word, رَعِنَا, innocent word. It's a look at us, pay attention to us. But they had other meanings attached to it at the back of the mind. As if you have gone off the track. So Allah says, don't use words of ambiguous, ambiguous import. See, you're using the word Raina, but at the back of your mind you're trying to say something else. Is that you've gone in the, their own language to say that you are drifting off, you know, you've gone off the track. He says, don't talk like that. Say Unzurna. Don't use words like that. Similarly, words, they change their meaning. The Father in Heaven is a beautiful word. But now it has other connotations. In Christendom, they tell us that Jesus is the only begotten Son. Begotten, not made. This is in their catechism. The Roman Catholics, the Anglicans, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Methodists, they're all in the, in the catechism. The religious principles that they expound in the churches teach their children. They say that Jesus is the only begotten Son. Begotten, not made. Don't make a mistake. He's not like Adam. Hazrat Adam alayhi salam. He was made by God. Every dog, pig and donkey was made by God. As such, Allah is the creator, sustainer, evolver. He's Rabbul Alameen. But Jesus is not like that. He was begotten, not made. And if words have any meaning, what does it mean? They are attributing to Allah an animal nature, the lower animal functions of sex. So Allah reacts very strongly in Surah Maryam. He says, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَنُ وَلَدَا And they say that Ar-Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten a son. Allah says, لَقَدْ جِئْتُمْ شَيْئًا عِدَّا is one of the most abominable assertions one can make. The worst swearing you can give Allah is this. The worst swearing, you want to swear him? This is the worst thing that you can say. That Allah begot a son. You are attributing to him an animal nature. The lower animal functions of sex. minhu. At it the skies are ready to burst. shakkal ardu. And the earth to split asunder. jibalu hadda. And the mountains to fall down in utter ruin. And the awlir rahmani walada. That they should say that ar-Rahman, the merciful God has begotten a son. The worst swearing you can give Allah is this. That if the heavens have feelings like you, O Muslims, Muslimah, if the heavens had feeling, emotions like you, to hear such words being uttered, he said the heavens would have fallen. If the earth had feelings like you, it would have split asunder, and the mountains fallen down in utter ruin. Such horrible swearing they give Allah. Does it move the Muslim? Not at all. It's not moving anybody. It's an amazing thing, an amazing situation. You see, the non-Arab world, the Muslims of the non-Arab world, 90% of the Muslims of the world are non-Arabs. They don't know Arabic. 
We have been taught the Quran to read parrot fashion. We read it. Sometimes we read far more beautiful than many Arabs. Some of our Hafiz and Qaris. But we don't understand a word. So we read these beautiful verses. We don't know what Allah is saying. But the Arab world, more than a hundred million of you, you understand what Allah is saying, what He is crying about. And it doesn't move anybody. This is an amazing situation. Amazing thing. If any of you, my brothers, you go home and your mother tells you, he says, you know this guy next door, he was swearing me like this. I won't use the words. You know what the other guy was swearing your mother. Or your wife says, you know this guy next door, you know, he was calling me names. I'm asking, can you eat? Can you sleep? No. What do you do? He says, I want to go and break his jaw, shut him up for good. And if I'm too weak, I say, I hire a gang. Somebody to do the job. Now it cost me 10,000 dirhams. I'll do the job. Shut him up for good. No. That's what, how much you feel for your mother, your sister, your wife, your daughter. And yet we say that we love Allah more than all these things. And yet when they swear him, they abuse him, what happens? Nothing. Nothing. No reaction. You know why? The spirit is gone out of us. We are the living dead. The living dead. We are on the siratul mustaqim, we are, but we are a dead people. We, have, we are dead on the right road. The outsider, the enemy, he is on the wrong road, but he's alive. He's alive on the wrong road, we are dead on the right road. <laughs> so Allah reacts. Allah reacts. The worst swearing you can give me is this. What are we to do? I said, talk to them. Reason with them. I don't say go and break the jaws. I don't say go and shoot them, kill them, cut the throats. No, no, no. Allah says, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati. Invite all to the ways of thy Lord with wisdom. Wal mawazatil hasanati. And with beautiful preaching. Wajadilhum billati ahsan. And reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. And I show you, show you some little ways, little ways. I go to the West. I go to England. I go to America. I talk to them. I says, you know, English is a foreign language to me, which it is. It's a foreign language. I acquired this, you know, from because they conquered my country and I went to a British colony, so they taught me English, so I learned English. If the French had conquered my country, I would be speaking French. If the Spanish had conquered my country, I would be speaking Spanish. But you Britishers, you English speaking people conquered my country, so you taught me to speak English, so I'm speaking English to you. But look, it's a foreign language to me. I want you to help me with your language. You say, you say, you say in your catechism that Jesus is the only begotten son. Begotten, not made. I say, will you please explain to me what you are trying to emphasize? You are trying to tell me something special. See, I can call any young man here, my son, my son, and I'm sure you won't mind, the child won't mind it, nor will the father and the mother mind it calling your child my son. But if some person, not knowing our relationship, wants to know, is he really your son? So then I have to tell you, no, you see, this young man, I like this little child, he reminds me of my son at home, my grandchild at home, so I call him my son. And he loves me like a father, like a grandfather, like an old uncle. So he calls me uncle, or he calls me grandpa, whatever. That is a relationship. But instead, if I said, yes, he is my begotten son, you know what I'm saying? What I'm insinuating? Horrible. I'm insinuating that the child is illegitimate. He is not his father's son, he is mine. I am responsible for his birth. The worst swearing I can give him is that. If you know the meaning. So I just want to know what you are trying to emphasize. That's all. What you are trying to tell me. Please explain. And wallah, I tell you, you won't come across an English-speaking person who will explain to you. There is no harder blow you can give him than to plead with him, please explain what are you trying to tell me. What do you mean when you say begotten, not made? What are you trying to tell me? How did it come about? Tell me. The nearest, in all my experience, the nearest to an explanation came from an American. See, the American is very militant. Now he is. We must give him credit. He is a fighter. 
And a fighter is good material. He's the best material to deal with. Not diplomats. You know, beating around the bush and cutting, and cutting favor with you and patting you on the back. Hypocrites. No, no, no. Let's have a straightforward a fight, an intellectual battle. And the American is good for that. He's a man. So an American, I had him, you know, with some people as visitors to the masjid. I, am, I happen to be one of the guides to the largest mosque in the southern hemisphere in my town, in Durban. And while I was guiding him, this subject cropped up, and I asked him the question, this question, because I was asking everybody, nobody answers it. I'm asking him, this American. I said, what do you mean this is, when you say begotten, not made? Will you please explain? He said, yes, it means sired by God. So what? He said, no, no, I don't mean that. But you ask me what it means, I'm telling you what it means. <laughs> now you see why Allah reacts. Now you see why he reacts. Sired is an a term used in animal husbandry. You see, they keep pedigrees of horses, and they tell you the father of this horse and the mother was so and so, and the great grandmother of this horse was so and so, and the great grandfather was so and so, and on and on. Pedigrees of horses, pedigrees of cows, bulls, the pedigree. So where they originate? Who was the great grandfather of that bull? Where did it come from? The Brahman bull. It came from India, you know, a hundred years ago, and from that grandfather we got this, then, and, 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 and this is his great great grandchild. Child. Pedigree. They use this term in animal husbandry. Sired. This bull was, this cow was sired by a certain bull. That's what it means. This is actually what it means. Now, it is the Judaism. Now, that term, father, is not in the Quran. Beautiful word. But it's not there. I said, that is a miracle. The 99 names are miracle. But you say, look, if you want to discount them, discount them. The miracle is that the commonest, the most readily available, the one that is being dangled before him for 23 years, he doesn't catch it. And he makes us to eschew that word. Don't use it. You see, Rabbul Alamin. He's Rabb, he's Rabb, he's Rabb. He's not Ab, Ab, Ab. Miracle. Substance of the message. Allah says, Another example I give you. This is do not the unbelievers see. These atheists, these agnostics, the people who deny the existence of God, can't they see? In other words, Allah expects them to see, to be able to see, to witness. That the heavens and the earth were joined together as one unit of creation. And he split them asunder. Who is he talking to? Who is he addressing? Kafir. Which Kafir? The Badwins of 1400 years ago? No, no, no. What can the poor man understand? Well, what did he know about the universe, about the creations of the heavens and the earth? What did he know? He only accepted whatever was said, if this was Allah's kalam, amanna saddakna. We hear and we accept, we believe. This was Iman that they had. They didn't have a grasp. Allah is not addressing those unbelievers of the times of Muhammad, or the unbelievers in the Congo, or among the Eskimos who might not believe in God. No, 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 no. He is talking to the men of science, men of learning, who are now expounding to the world the theory of creation. That these astronomers with the mighty telescopes, when they are looking into space and they are analyzing the, the movements in the heavens, and they're telling you as if they did it. If they are the ones who are making these things, this machine, this clock to work. This clock of the universe. The way they explain it as if they are doing it. Such a person with his great learning, he says that this universe came into being with a big bang billions of years ago. Because he's watching the universe and he's noticing that these heavenly bodies are receding from a central place somewhere. Is all going out in all directions, moving away, away, away. Like a balloon. When you blow it gets bigger and bigger, something like that is happening in the skies, in the heavens. These galaxies, they're receding from us at a faster and faster speed. 
at a faster and faster speed. And once they reach the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, once they reach that speed, we won't be able to see it anymore because the light that is coming from there, it won't be coming anymore, it's going away. So we must discover bigger and better telescopes to see the sights, the wonders, otherwise we'll miss the bus. So they say that this universe came into being with the Big Bang, the Big Bang Theory. Who says that? The most learned men of science, astronomers. They say, hey, where did you get these funny ideas from? This fairy tale about a Big Bang. So no, 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 it is not fairy tales. These are facts, demonstrable facts. We can demonstrate it, show you what is happening. And from that we can conclude, if we had a film and put in reverse gear, so we could see what is happening is all coming back again. With the way it's going out, the balloon, if we can deflate it, you'll see it all coming back to one central point. And there was a Big Bang. When did you discover this? He said, yesterday. Because 50 years is yesterday in the history of man. What is 50 years? Nothing. As an, an illiterate man in the desert, a person who didn't know how to read or write, a person who couldn't sign his own name, he could have, couldn't have known this, could he? He says, no, never. Impossible. Man doesn't know astronomy. He hasn't got the instruments. He hasn't got a telescope. Nothing. In the desert, and among an Ummi people, illiterate people. And he is now telling you, this man in the desert, 1,400 years ago, Kana taratkan, fafatakna huma, and he split them asunder. And you biologists, people who study minute life, microplotism, the amoeba, he says, you know, life originated in the sea, water. Without this water, no life. And they tell you, he says, look, we look back in time, in space, he says, look, this is how life originated. There was a time when this earth was a molten mass, nothing could have survived here, everything boiling, boiling, and over a period of billions of years, you know, the vapors went up and came down, and the vapors went up and came down and started cooling this earth, it took a billions of years, and then started life, germs, plant life, and all these things started. At one time, there was nothing, and then it started. Where did life come from? He says, from the sea. Certain chemical actions, the sun playing its part, and life started from there. Mm -hmm. When did you find this out? It's yesterday. Because 50 years is yesterday in the history of man. An illiterate man in the desert, he couldn't have known that, could he? He says, no, never. He says, well, listen. He says, and he has made from water every living thing. He says, will you then not believe? Who? You, men of science, you, men of learning, you kafir, you atheist, you agnostic, why can't you believe that this is not his handiwork? As Allah says, أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِهِمْ أَنَّا أَنْسَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ يُطْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَرَحْمَةً وَذِكْرَ لِقَوْمِ يُمِنُونَ And these are signs, blessings, and a remembrance for a people who believe that he might have written this. In a verse preceding this, verse 48 of Surah An-Kabut, chapter 29, he says, min qablihi min kitabin. He says, you were not in the habit, O Muhammad, you were not in the habit of reading as if out of a book. فَوَيْلٌ لِلْقَاسِيَةِ قُلُوبُهُمْ مِنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ